<clears throat> Today I'll just try and be short and sweet with the, uh, the training here. So today's takeaways, we're going to review the, again, non-medical services are non-medical. Again, highlighted there. <coughs> review the four changes in the care coordination, medical management part of things, and then start to kind of identify some issues that are going to uh, impact contracting, credentialing, and provider services. <coughs> so again, just need to keep reiterating this, that this, these non-medical services are just going to be an entirely new and different thing for us, that there, there's no such thing as medical necessity when it's a non-medical type service. It's subjective, it's personal, it's unique. So um, when you see all these uh, different bullet points on there, that does, again, kind of highlight um, highlight that those points. If you remember the, the video last week, in a week, there was the, the home where the, the member had mold. And it's like, I mean, what would we have done in that situation? Oh, I'm sorry, we don't, mold abatement is not our, not our covered service. So that would, I mean, and kept the member in that, that environment? Or would we have figured out a way to get home health in there uh, to do like a, a big cleanup? Would we figure out if uh, we could have transferred them over to an assisted living or another type of living situation? So there's, there's a lot of other non-traditional type approaches we would have taken, um, or we will be taking in the future. And again, I just want, if you remember that, like, there was one of those videos where the service coordinator got a hug from the member. That's that's a frequent occurrence when you work one-on-one -on -one with a member out in the community. And that's that just highlights how different this is and how that it's not medical. So, uh, here were kind of the, the four big things impacting care coordination medical management. Um, one is there's going to be probably a significant amount of movement as someone tra uh, goes back and forth between care coordination and service coordination. But ultimately, if a service coordinator within our model is involved, they become the single point of contact for the member because they're out there, in some cases, quarterly doing face-to-face -face visits. Uh, second big change is the, the benefit coverage policies are in development right now regarding how much LTSS services will be authorized. So uh, adult daycare, um, you know, home modification, you know, are we going to approve a $10,000 wheelchair lift? And with that particular service, there's a fine line between making a residence, um, you know, accessible versus kind of adding, uh, you know, cosmetic stuff to the home that's an improvement to the home, not necessarily for the benefit of accessibility. So we'll, we need to kind of make sure we're um, somewhat clear on that. Uh, you know, as, as Ray has pointed out, the formulary uh, changes for specialty drugs is going to be a huge cost item for us. And then just in general, making sure we're, um, what we're expending for things are appropriate utilization and are under the MLR not losing $80 million at United and Ohana cost combined that first year as well. So we've kind of gone through all these areas and now we're going to get into the plan administration part of it, the contracts, credentialing, and provider, provider services. So here are four changes I can readily see with that. The first is with the um, community care, foster family homes, PERS units, etc. There's somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 new providers from long-term services supports that we've never really historically dealt with. Um, so there's going to be, that's going to drive new contracts, new rate structures. Um, Jane is making me aware of, we, we've got a process for delegating, uh, a delegation contract that is multiple pages long with multiple bullet points and processes that we need to follow. So things like um, delegating, um, if we're going to um, logistic errors, transportation provider, same thing. This is going to take us months and months and months to evaluate and implement if that's the direction we go. Um, there's going to be entirely new credentialing roles and interactions, uh, and that's the, the Community Ties of America oversees a lot of these foster homes and just new training requirements and roles. So when you look at it, go, this is a 35 to 40 percent increase in the provider network workload. I mean, that's going to impact Paula's group and uh, Michelle's group downstairs and being able to work with them. Um, 
again, this is a huge effort to obtain signed executed contracts. My understanding is, and I'm going to get Pat on this, so all the contract formats we just submitted for readiness, once we get those back from the state, then I mean, don't we have to get all those re-signed with all the... Um, so those, these foster family homes are overseen by the Community Ties of America, so I don't know if we have any situations like that where if the, the Mahoy foster family home uh, isn't performing well and Community Ties of America somehow says, you know, we're going to take you offline, well, how they communicate that back to our credentialing department? How do we, what do we do with those members now? Do we have to, do the, the service coordinators have to figure out, move them to a, an appropriate care home? I mean, now because it the, introduces these other third party entities that we have to deal with, these are big changes. And then there's going to be new training requirements as we go out and, you know, train providers on this is how you bill, this is how you submit claims, this is how you work with Aloha Care. This is how you support service coordination. This is how you support the members' long-term service and support needs. So these are all new things that we're going to be responsible for kind of extending out there in the community. Um, and there you go. So continue to work work through the different um, sections here in the organization. 